Hey there gang, it is time for another unboxing video. As always, I have been given this box of comic books to grade for sale on eBay. And again, as always, I have no idea what has been sorted into this box before I crack into it. So, I'm going to dig in now, and you and I will make that discovery together. What gems of wholesome comic book goodness will we find? Who knows? But if you like comic books, stick around. We're going to have some fun. Hey there, Bubbies. Welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this is another unboxing video. And like I said in the teaser, when I have been given one of these boxes to grade for sale on eBay, I don't know what's in it. And uh, it's just it's just so much fun to crack into a box, make a bunch of discoveries, and to share that kind of in real time with you. So uh, you know, again, up front, just to let you know, these books are, as I said, being graded for sale on eBay. The seller name is .com Comics. And if you are so inclined, these books generally get posted about a week or two from when I grade them, from when this video goes up. So keep a lookout, you know, if you uh, feel like you want to bid on any of these. But again, selling these books to you isn't really the point. The point is just you know, sharing that love and joy of comic books and that that gosh wow sense of discovery. So, well, what do we have in this box? Well, we're gonna I'm gonna only do about half of this box for this video to keep it kind of kind of uh, you know in line with optimum YouTube viewing lines. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it looks to me you know, we've got some cardboard stuffer here at the top. But it looks to me like uh, the top stack here is some Silver Age stuff. We'll go a little further down, about halfway, and then the rest of it, you know, from that point down to the bottom that we'll get to in the next video that we'll start to get into in this video, but mostly the next video, based on the bags and boards here, I'm guessing that's a lot of silver and copper age stuff. And it looks like we've got a magazine here as well, either a magazine or a graphic novel of some kind. Now, when I say silver age here at the top, the books we're going to look at today, what exactly does silver age mean? I am going to do a video uh, that will encompass all of the ages, how they were named, how they're measured, what their starting and end points are. But for the purposes of this video, uh, so that we're all on the same page, let's take a look at, at what we mean when we say Silver Age. Oh, I know that there are some of you who will disagree with what I'm about to say. Some of you who, who are frankly going to get a little pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> what I have to say, but that's okay. You go ahead and leave your comments down below. The Silver Age. It lasts in total 12 years, 9 months from July 1956 until March 1969. But, but that's the Silver Age total. It can be broken down into early, middle, and late periods. The early Silver Age, of course, kicks off with Showcase Number 4, which went on sale July 5, 1956. This period lasts one year, seven months, from July 56 until January 1958. So what is this period? It is everything after the introduction of the Barry Allen version of The Flash, but before DC's second attempt to revive a Golden Age superhero, the Hal Jordan Green Lantern. So you have The Flash, you even have The Martian Manhunter, but pretty much the storytelling style and structure is still firmly within the Uranium Age modality, again, other than these outliers like The Flash. We then turn to the Middle Silver Age, and that begins with Adventure Comics number 247 on sale February 27th, 1958. The period lasts nine years, four months, from February 58 to May 1967. So this middle period is what you might refer to as the Silver Age proper. And what happens here? Well, with the introduction of the Legion of Superheroes in this issue of Adventure Comics, we then get, in very short order, a rapid expansion of the Superman mythos. You get the introduction of the Fortress of Solitude, Brainiac, Supergirl, Super Dog, Super Cat, Super Horse, Super Monkey, <laughs> the Phantom Zone and all of its villains, the resurgence of Lex Luthor as the arch nemesis, and 101 Shades of Kryptonite. And everything in all of that, all of those seeds that are planted and carry over into all of the Superman titles, those then cross-pollinate into all of the DC books, and you get this, this real cohesive shared universe. And that concept then transfers over to Marvel and various other companies. 
the period ends with the atom number 32. And I know <laughs> that may seem like a fairly nondescript book, but the important thing here is that it is the last issue to feature the, the famous iconic DC go-go checks across the top. Now, there is actually an issue of The Adventures of Bob Hope. I forget the issue number that was on sale the same week as this issue of The Atom, but for the sake of argument, I picked The Atom as the goalpost. So from here, we then transition into the late Silver Age, and that starts with Batman number 194 on sale June 6, 1967, and this period lasts one year, 10 months, from June 67 to March 69. So what is the change? What happens here? Well, about the time the DC go-go checks go away, well, frankly, so does DC. <laughs> DC goes away as a private company, lands in the hands of the Kinney Corporation, it enters corporate America. And with that, we get the ascension of Carmine Infantino as publisher. And Carmine, he brings along this shift from a, a plot-centric style of storytelling into something that relies more on visuals and style. And that is best typified right here by this issue of Batman with its logo-busting cover. Before this... This kind of thing would have been, you know, utterly unthinkable when the title of a magazine was Sancrosanct Above All Else. And then the final book of the Silver Age is Adventure Comics number 380. And like the Atom, it has a, uh, a cohort. There's an issue of Action Comics on sale this same week. And the important thing, though, is that both books are the last 12-cent comics at DC. I picked the Adventure Comics issue as the uh, as the end point though because this is also the last issue to feature the Legion of Superheroes. After this, when we transition to the 15 cent issues the following month, the Legion moves over to a backup spot over in Action Comics. So there you go. That is the Silver Age. <laughs> and like I said, I know some of you don't want to see this. You don't want to believe that, you know, every every major point of the Silver Age is a DC book, but that's really just how it is. DC's been around from the very beginning, and frankly, rather it's golden, silver, bronze, modern. Most of what happens happens first at DC and then gets transferred and copied in other places. But for you Marvel zombies, let's just go ahead and acknowledge that there is such a thing as the Marvel Age. It's kind of a subgenre, and that uh, that Marvel Age, there you go. <laughs> it lasts 11 years, 9 months from August 1961 until April 1973. It begins, of course, with Fantastic Four number one on sale August 8, 1961, and it ends with The Amazing Spider Man number 122 on sale April 10, 1973, which is, of course, part two of the Death of Gwen Stacy saga. Now, now, I know there are some of you who will say that, you know, the Marvel Age has to end with the last book scripted by Stan Lee, except that he did script some books later. And, uh, uh, of course, at this point, he still had his hand very firmly on the rudder. But kind of the important thing about this book isn't just the death of Gwen Stacy. This is really this is really where he lets go of that rudder. It's the first time where he says, OK, I really don't like what you guys are doing here, but if it's what you want to do, go ahead. So that's what what really ends the Marvel Age. So there you go. That is the Marvel Age. That is the Silver Age. And now let's just go ahead and get back to the unboxing. All right, so that is your uh, lesson for today. <laughs> I, I hope you enjoyed that. If you if you disagreed with anything I said, then please do leave a note in the comments below. But let's take a look at what we had in this box. Looks like we've got some Archie and old Pep comics, huh? Look at that. Archie and Jughead do wonderful bird imitations, Daddy. What bird would you like them to imitate? A homing pigeon. <laughs> Go home. Yeah, it's a pretty Spartan decoration there for the for the uh, lodge household, I should think. But anyway, well, how's that for switching gears, huh? From Pep to Our Army at War. Looks like an early Sergeant Rock, a nice Joe Kubert cover. Our Fighting Forces, the Flying Pooch, Gunner and Sarge. Gunner and Sarge, you know, starred in Our Fighting Forces for a long, long time. The hour is missing here for some reason. It just says Fighting Forces. Isn't that weird? Did the title change officially? Nope, still are Fighting Forces. You can see that in the Indicia. But it is weird. I wonder if if that just dropped off a part of the print run or 
if all issues are like that. But anyway, Gunner and Sarge, uh, they, uh, they held the lead spot in our fighting forces for a long, long time. And Pooch was part of that uh, team. And I don't know, is this the first appearance of Pooch? It, uh, it may well be. Or is it just the first time he was a flying pooch? I don't know. I'll have to look it up. Well, here's another pooch, Pooch Tang Hunter. And you can see here that uh, Pooch has changed colors. <laughs> He's now looking very Rex the Wonder Dog. He's gone from Rin Tin Tin to Rex the Wonder Dog. Uh, that's funny. And what issue number is that? I don't know if uh, this one was, the first one was 62. This one is 63. Here's 71. And see, still pooch. Uh, gray wash cover. Some people really get into collecting the uh, gray wash covers that were on a lot of DC books uh, at about this time. Here's some more Our Fighting Forces. And there's Gunner and Sarge. I don't see pooch this time. Our Army at War. Some more Sergeant Rock. This is 107. Oh, that Fighting Forces was, did I say that was 86? Here's 107, 111, and, and by the way, uh, these war books do pretty well for us on eBay, uh, you know, um, much like the humor books and, and other things, they weren't as highly prized by the early fanboys as the superhero books. They tended to be collected, by and large, by more casual readers, and so you see them more in grades, mid-grades like this. Uh, and so they tend to be pretty collectible today. And really not just in the high grades, but in almost all grades. Here's our Army at War number 115. So we've gone from 10 to 12 cents here. This would not be the first 12 center, I guess, because that looks right. As I mentioned in another video, the first month of 12 cent covers, that 12 is kind of funky wonky in most of the boxes. Mystery in Space, and it looks like this centerfold is loose. This is number 72. We just uh, we just posted and sold on eBay a bunch of Mystery in Space books that uh, you saw graded here in a, a recent video, and they all did really quite well. You know, mid mid range, some lower. You know, we're talking, you know, three fives to fives, maybe here and there, a five, five, or six. And they did 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks. So, um, you know. Good for them. Good for us. <laughs> uh, Mystery in Space 62. Some more Adam Strange. Here is a, an early Superman. Or not super early, but early-ish. 132. With a great three-part novel. Hooray! A full-length three-part novel. That was a big deal back in the day when, you know, even a, a, a one-character book like Superman... Not in the anthology, but a regular, you know, solo title would still have, you know, three stories per book, and have all three of those stories be be in effect one story. That was that was kind of a big deal, <laughs> and of course today, you know, most creators today uh, they cannot, for the life of them, write a story for a single issue. Everything takes about six, eight, ten, twelve issues, <laughs> so. That's decompression for you. But, uh, yeah. It doesn't say if that's... Well, it must be an imaginary novel. Let's see. Does it actually say... No, I guess this is before we invented... You know, nice Wayne Boring art there. Before we invented the term imaginary story. Of course, aren't they all, but... Let's see what else we have here. Superman 137. Super Menace. The Super Creature from Krypton, Superman 151. See a lot of this book. Uh, this is Superman 154 with uh, Mr. Mixtel Pitlick. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? <laughs> Tell me in the comments below with uh, a banana submarine. There you go. All right, let's see the next stack here. Some Wonder Woman. And actually, Wonder Girl held the uh, cover spot for a long time. And uh, if you don't know the story, I, I'm sure I've told it here before, 
But when Wonder Girl joined the the Teen Titans, the editor, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll put their names in the comments below because I can't remember them off the top of my head. But whoever it was who was editing um, Brave and the Bold and then Teen Titans grabbed grabbed Wonder Girl to use in the book, not realizing that the Wonder Girl who was appearing in the Wonder Woman books was Wonder Woman as a girl, was not a separate character. <laughs> So that that's how Donna Troy was created because they had to come up with it, come up with an identity for this uh, for this Wonder Girl, or else try and explain how Wonder Woman as a girl was part of the Teen Titans, and then that because of course the obvious thing being you know if it was time travel then why why couldn't they have Superboy as part of the Teen Titans? So I guess they didn't want to go there. <laughs> so they went with a slightly more convoluted story of creating a a whole new identity for uh, a different Wonder Girl character. And here we go, uh, Wonder Woman 117, featuring Wonder Girl. Wonder Woman 131, Shades of Pluto. Tales of the Unexpected, featuring Space Ranger. That's number 65. Number 73, with Robot Space Ranger. Back into the War Book, Star Spangled War Stories, number 91. And it looks here by 99, we have uh, made the transition to the uh, long running feature of The Land That Time Forgot. We've got uh, Soldiers Fighting Dinosaurs, which is certainly something I would have gone in for when I was a kid. That is number 99. 103. Doom at Dinosaur Island. Dun dun dun. Fire Joe, this thing looks hungry enough to even eat a robot. Oh, is that? Oh, that's G.I. Joe, uh, or G.I. GI Robot. Is G.I. Robot in this one, too? Huh. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's G.I. Robot. Here is uh, Showcase 33. So that's kind of the early reboot Silver Age Aquaman, who, who frankly wasn't that much different. Then this is... Showcase 36. So the Adam first appeared, I think, in 34. So this would be the third appearance of the Ray Palmer Adam. That's pretty cool. Here's a Superboy with the one and only appearance of Lex Luthor's Superdog Destructo. Oh, and this is neat. <laughs> Just because I don't see a lot of them. Uh, I mean, a few, but not a super ton. This is Rip Hunter, Time Master number nine, the Alien King of a thousand BC, and we're back to Pep. Oh my gosh, what do we do? Have it restrung? <laughs> uh, that is Pep number one forty-eight. Looks like we got just a few of these Silver Age books in here to go. Let's grab them all in one fell swoop. One swoop of Felmus. First one's a coverless book. What is this? <laughs> coverless, duh. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I, I realized it. Wouldn't want me to put an 8.0 or a 9.4 on this book. Want to make sure I realize that it's got no cover. <laughs> Thanks for helping. That's fantastic 421 anyway. This one is beat to hell. Might as well not have a cover. Fantastic 431, the mad menace of the macabre mole man. Oh, Stan Lee and his alliteration. Avengers number 31. Amazing Spider-Man 39. This is the uh, first John Romita Spider-Man after uh, Steve Ditko walked. And uh, I did just post, by the way, if you haven't seen it, a review of the Ditko biography that just came out, Ditko Shrugged, from uh, Hermes Press. So uh, if you like, if you like Steve Ditko, check that out and see if I like the book about his life. Amazing Spider-Man seventy-two, the Shocker, rocked by the Shocker, the Rock Shocker, the Shock Rocker, Quicksilver. I like Quicksilver and Blue better than Green. I think. I don't know why. 
number 68, Crisis on Campus. It was right about this period where Stan Lee was visiting college campuses that, like every Marvel book, had to have one of these Crisis on Campus stories. Here's another one that, <laughs> again, just in case I miss it, a little note telling me it is coverless. That's X-Men number four. Who first appeared in number four? The Brotherhood of Evil Mutants and Blob and uh, Unis, Anus, whatever his name is. <laughs> Uh, 33 of Fantastic Four with a uh, kind of a photo collage cover. Invisible Girl about to trip over that uh, sea anemone. I live in a man -am -am <laughs> uh, X-Men 26. Avengers 30. These are low grade, but you know they'll still do okay on eBay. These will... These will still draw 10 or 12 bucks each, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. Detective Comics, the villain of a hundred elements. This one's got some water damage. And here we are in Batman's alien hunter phase. <laughs> oh, that's funny. The Bizarre Polka Dot Man, where is Polka Dot, is it Polka Dot Man that's going to appear in the Suicide Squad movie? I think it is. So if this is the first Polka Dot Man appearance, I'll have to look up and see if it is Detective Comics 300. Um, this could be a fair investment for you, because I don't know if uh, if the Polka Dot Man's first appearance has really taken off. Who Who is playing him in the movie? Is it Nathan Fillion? Or Pete Davidson. I'll have to look it up. I'll put it in a comment on the bottom of the screen. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Detective Comics 305. Again, more aliens. That is a weird-looking alien. <laughs> uh, Alpha, the experimental man. You would think it's about time for an Alpha, Alpha reboot. I don't know if he's out of proportion, or if he's supposed to be that tall, and if that bike is supposed to be that small, I don't know. All right, and this is just a random backing board. And just so to work ourselves to the halfway point of this box, let's grab the first few of what I think are going to be some Copper and Silver Age books. Let's grab to about there, and I realize this is off screen and you can't see what I'm saying by there, but trust me, that's about halfway. Actually, I'm going to grab a couple more because I can see I've got a run of something here. And that run of something is Punisher. I love this series, mostly for the Mike Zek artwork. And there's uh, Punisher number one. I remember when this came out. And I remember being confused. You'll see here, it's a four-issue miniseries. Oh, nope, we've changed our mind. It's going to be a five-issue miniseries. <laughs> nope, 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 definitely a four. Definitely going to be four issues. Uh, uh, okay, yep, still four. Still four. And uh, nah, I think we're going to go five. <laughs> anyway, those will do well. Sometimes I like to sell that as a set. I have a theory that as a set, you get a better price for the later issues uh, than you do when you sell them all individually. So in the aggregate, you do better selling them as a set. You know, you end up not getting as much for the first issue, but uh, you end up getting more for the later issues than you would when they're all sold, excuse me, singly. <laughs> uh, I had a little burp there, burp, heart attack, something. <clears throat> what if Spider-Man joined the Fantastic Four? Well, he's joined the Avengers, so, and actually, I think, didn't he join the Fantastic Four at one point? I don't know, I lose track of Marvel in the 90s. I was a big, big Marvel fan at this time. And there it is, this one. This one right now, we have this, like, um, I, I get, this is like spawn number one. We get about three of these in every box I crack. But, uh, and like, like spawn number one, it completely defies the law of, you know, of supply and demand. Because there's so many of them out there sold in high grade that you would think that would depress the price. But it still goes, still goes well. 
And even in mid-grade, there's one that we have online right now that's like a 5.5. Five. And right now it's going for about 60 bucks, and the auction has another couple days left. It's crazy. We've got a bunch of these uh, online right now, so this will add to it the original Wolverine miniseries, which was a uh, which was a great book, by the way. So it's well deserved. This third issue is hard to find in high grade because of the black cover. You tend to pick up all of the little tick marks here. So that one, when it's in high grade, does well because it's much rarer, rarer, rarer <laughs> in high grade. Preacher. Well, that's a fairly modern book, isn't it? Preacher number one, 1995. And uh, prices on this have kind of come down since the uh, the TV show that I never watched. Oh, here's the first appearance of Carnage. This is one of those books that if you've got the newsstand edition, you might could get a few extra bucks for that. This is obviously the direct sales edition. So this first carnage here is second. Actually, no, this I think this is second carnage. This first one is in 361. So that's second carnage. That's third carnage. Spawn number nine. First appearance of Angela for whatever the hell she's worth. Spawn number one. <laughs> I could have predicted we were going to have a spawn in this box. And that'll go for, you know... Well, we've got one right now, again, just like that uh, Marvel Superhero Secret Wars I just told you about. This one we've got online on eBay right now, a mid-grade, like a six, and it's at 13 bucks. Uh, you know, and you would think the prices would fall right off a cliff. Usually, you know, a very fine near mint is 15 or 20 bucks. Easy. This one's got some heavy tick marks, so this might even be a five. Uh... Depending on what the back cover looks like, it could be a four or five. But uh, that'll still that'll still bring at least ten bucks. Now the other side of the coin is this one. You could hardly give this one away. And I, I have told the boss we shouldn't be trying to sell this as a single. This is the first appearance of Bishop. Actually, I think it's his first full appearance. I think he had a cameo in Uncanny X Men two eighty one, if I if I remember correctly. But again, can't hardly give this away. This is like a two dollar, three dollar, four dollar book. You watch, this will go for fifteen bucks just because, <laughs> just to prove me wrong. But um, yeah, I've tried to convince the boss that we're losing money trying to sell that as a single when it goes for you know less than seven bucks. Here's Uncanny X Men two hundred one, a first appearance of Cable as a baby. And this is, speaking of the boss, uh, he actually started the business uh, flipping this book. He would buy this book on eBay, um, you know, snipe it, you know, jump in, swoop in at the last few seconds and get it for a decent price. And, uh, and then, you know, send it to CGC, grade it and flip it. And, uh, and that's kind of how he started the company. And he did much better then, I have to say, than me. I I can't do that for some reason. You know, if I buy a book for ten dollars on eBay and thinking I'm getting a good deal because it's uh, got a value of fifty bucks, and I try to flip it, <laughs> I'm as liable as not to sell it for five. I don't know why. I have no luck trying to flip things. Uh, and so this is the last last book. We're back in the Silver Age. A not very good cover at all. By a, is that Storanko? I'm not sure if that's Steranko or I don't see his name, but this is in the period when he was doing stuff. It's a pretty horrid cover anyway. <laughs> X-Men number 55. So that's it. That is what we've got in that half of the box. Anyway, come back next time. We will do the rest of this box. Until then, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.